1996, the first Resident Evil released on the PlayStation, and the world was rocked by the arrival of survival horror. Arriving at a time when norms were yet to be established in 3D gaming, and where the ambitions of creators were only limited by the available technology, this game changed so much of what we thought was possible with horror games. Far from presenting an immature or schlocky take that used excessive blood or body horror to hide the lack of substance, Resident Evil blew the world away with its slow-paced, creepy atmosphere, focus on exploration, solving a mystery, and disempowering the player in the face of far more dangerous enemies. The far-reaching cultural impact of this game can still be felt even today. While monsters created through infection had come before like in Richard Matheson's I Am Legend, Resident Evil codified the idea of the pandemic zombie and sealed it in the collective psyche of the world forevermore. And despite some pretty awful voice acting, you were almost a Jill sandwich. It really pushed what cinematic storytelling could be in games. It focused on wild science fiction concepts like using genetic engineering to create super soldiers and other bioweapons, but also dipped its toes in politics by presenting ideas of immoral medical research being conducted in the name of shameless profiteering. We got some great heroes in Chris, Jill, and Barry, and a comic book supervillain in Wesker. Sorry, spoilers and one hell of a trip through a blood-stained hellscape where things have learnt to walk that ought to crawl. Time has passed since that first release, and the mainline games were constantly trying to escalate the threat, and had been pushing the danger of global bioterror more and more with each entry. Long gone were the small enclosed environments, and the feeling of isolation. Now we have the zombie president of the United States of America. The slow-paced tactical gameplay had given way to something that looked more like a military shooter, one that lacked any of the features that make those games enjoyable, or anything that Resident Evil fans like to see. The series had lost any sense of grounding as well. Sure, there's no Raccoon City in the real world, but there are places like Raccoon City, and I could imagine the RE universe being almost identical to ours at one point, but it has long since bloated into something more like a comic book continuity, with our mainline characters rocking skills so intense, they may as well be superpowers leading one to wonder if there's any point to this zombie weapons program at all. RE6 is considered something of a series low point. It's not exactly a bad game, but it showed that the series had really lost its way. So once again, it was time for things to be shaken up. It was time for Resident Evil to find a new identity, or at least rediscover some of its old one. As much as I love the mainline cast, there's no place for anti-zombie gigachads in slow-paced horror. And if they were serious about scaring people, they'd need to show them something they'd never seen before. They needed a new mystery to uncover, and a new horror to face. The developers conceived not hulking soulless terminators or grotesque abominations, but something far more familiar. Something with a face that looked like ours, that could speak with a human voice. Something with an original story that needed to be uncovered while we desperately tried to escape from it. And in order to once again completely disempower their players, they'd need a new protagonist. Our hero will be making his entrance soon, I promise. But before we can really talk about RE7, we need to take a brief detour back to 2005 and meet a man named Leon and talk about his working holiday in Spain. Resident Evil 4 changed everything. We lost the fixed camera perspective, the slow-paced horror, the extreme limitations in items and inventory space, and even the magic chests that teleported all our stuff between safe rooms. And yeah, that looks like Leon Kennedy, but it's not the naive rookie cop we met during the Raccoon City outbreak. Now, sure, his character progression is natural. Time has passed, and Leon's changed his job and matured. Or at the very least, he's grown a little cynical. Which, given what he went through to get here, is quite believable. Even so, this could easily have been a completely different character or even a completely different game, which is basically what happened to Devil May Cry. Now, I do have an entire video in the works for RE4. It might be up on the channel already. I'm doing these out of sequence. So I'm not here to analyze it specifically, only what it did for better or worse to the Resident Evil brand. It's almost unheard of for a game to change up its gameplay like this, and it's a move that seriously divided the RE fanbase. Yes, a lot of games had to switch up their playstyles when they went from 2D to 3D, and many games add new features with each iteration, but for a well-established series to just change direction like this one was one hell of a bold step. 
It is a testament to the overall quality of the game and its story that Capcom were able to land this so well. For you see, while the RE community is divided on what they want, all but the most resistant have to agree that RE4 is a damn good game, and it sold gangbusters. This told Capcom two things. Number one, they were more than welcome to continue making RE games just like this one. But more importantly, it told them that the community was okay with them completely shaking up the game's formula like this again if they wanted to. And that's important for our conversation because that is exactly what they did here. What I remember most about the run-up to the launch of RE7 was the rumoured possibility of it being something of a series soft reboot. Maybe as a way to trim away some of the bloat that had swollen up within the series canon. When I looked at the game, I didn't see anything I recognised, and I was actually kind of excited about this. It would have been bold and daring, just like what they did with RE4. Because of RE4, the fanbase was more accepting of a sudden shift in perspective, and now that it's happened twice, I feel like changing the formula every few games is in itself a part of the Resident Evil formula. This time, we were moved from an over-the-shoulder view to a first-person view, and while I could see the benefit of this, I was a little apprehensive. The first-person perspective is a great way to narrow the player's field of vision and reduce their overall situational awareness, and in turn, heighten the overall feeling of vulnerability that horror wants to cultivate. One advantage that games have over other media when it comes to horror is we are much more invested in the protagonist and their safety, simply because we are the protagonist, and we'll to one degree or another map ourselves onto even the most well-characterised heroes. Looking through their eyes helps a lot with that investment, which is why I think the first-person perspective is a good fit for the genre, and why it gained so much popularity in the wake of the release of games like Amnesia. Well, that and the most annoying people on the internet screaming into their webcams while playing these games. I was, however, a little apprehensive about Resident Evil going first-person because A. I was concerned they'd go full Amnesia and drop the combat, and B. I was worried that one of the few remaining flagship horror brands was now following trends where it had once set them. But I was still somewhat excited by the fact I didn't recognise anything I saw. There were no zombies or parasites in the trailers or promotional screenshots, just this family of seemingly insane people, and us being locked in a confined space with them. So, despite a little scepticism, people were excited that Resident Evil was giving up on the global bioterror angle and absurd Hollywood action and returning to its roots as a horror game. And to add not only to the sense that this was something completely new, but to the overall sense of vulnerability they wanted to inspire, they gave us a completely new character to control. They gave us... Ethan Winters. Hey baby! I just wanted to send a quick hello and I love you. We actually begin our story by seeing a rather heartfelt message that was sent to Ethan from his wife, Mia. Before we get a glimpse of a very different message. Ethan. You were right. I did lie to you. I shouldn't have. All I can say is that if you get this. Stay away. This is quite odd to me, and I'm not entirely sure if he even got it, but honestly, do you think a husband could just let something like that go? Yeah. We see a long, open road surrounded by wide American swampland, and a solitary vehicle moving down it before we hear the voice of our hero for the first time. Officially, Mia Winters has been dead for three years. She had been away from home much longer than that because of what she referred to as a babysitting gig. Ethan hasn't exactly been able to let go of his wife's passing though, as evident by the fact he's driving to some remote location, where a strange letter that appeared out of nowhere implies that Mia is waiting for him. There's a lot I like about this opening. While it's highly curated and does the Dark Souls thing of dropping a boss on you before we've even had a chance to get to grips with the controls, I really like how well it sells how isolated the Baker family estate is, and how far our hero is from anything resembling hell. In the first Resident Evil, our team was dropped into a mountainous area by a helicopter that abandoned them when things got rough, forcing them to flee into a mansion. Now we start with a very wide-angle shot of the world and zoom in. This constant narrowing is abundant all the way through this section. 
Even while we're out in the swamp, there's a sense of being funneled, of the world getting smaller, as we slip down banks that we can't climb up again and crawl under... Okay. Right about here is where you hear the alarm bells and think, maybe your dead wife isn't the one who wants you to come this way. Ethan enters the guest house of the seemingly abandoned property, and the door swings shut, marking the last time he will see the light of day until tomorrow. And still, the world gets smaller, going from these tight, low-ceiling dark rooms, further down as if we are descending into the very depths of hell, down into cold, damp stone, and down further still into tighter and tighter spaces, smaller and smaller, until we are almost submerged in disgusting water. I mean, I'm not sure if they were shooting for symbolism here, but this really does sell that Ethan and in turn we the player are about as far from hope and help as we could possibly be. Much to our surprise, we actually find Mia very quickly. Only things aren't all they seem to be. Did anyone see you? Did he see you? We're gonna be a family now that you're here. <laughs> And even before we are given a real chance to fight back, our capacity to do so is really stunted. <laughs> Making this, especially for someone new to the game, one of the most frustratingly difficult boss fights that we have to deal with. There is a method to lining up headshots on Mia though. It's something I figured out while playing RE2 Remake. You really just need to be swaying in time with the head movement and you'll line up your shots much easier than just standing still or retreating. This is pretty useful training overall because some of the enemies later can be really hard to line up a shot on. And so, with our somewhat dramatic tutorial out of the way, it's time for Ethan to meet Jack Baker. Welcome to the family, son. Resident Evil 7 wasn't just a big return to form, it was also a return to where it all began in a lot of ways. The setting is a large house with multiple sections that have to be revisited on more than one occasion. Hard limitations returned and rooting through every nook and cranny for every little helpful item was once again an essential part of the gameplay loop. 7 wasn't the first entry to introduce ammunition crafting, but it definitely took it to a new level with a variety of mixtures that could be used to create different loadouts, and effectively create some variation in available resources. A more experienced player, for example, would need to mix much fewer healing chemicals, and as such have a lot more resources for a variety of ammunition. It brought back the safe rooms and the limited inventory, and the need to explore for the solution to elaborate puzzle locks by moving in progressively larger circles between safe rooms, and transferring items and resources from one area to another. It did all this with some of the most impressive visuals that had ever been displayed on an 8th generation console, and only stumbled in a couple of areas. So, not only do we have an actual numbered entry in the RE series, but we also have something of a spiritual successor to the original Raccoon City saga. In another universe, this could easily have been a completely unique IP, developed by a studio that openly touted their love for RE as their inspiration for the game. It did a lot to recapture the magic of that first trek through the Spencer Mansion as either Chris or Jill. But it needed to do more. It needed to add something original, something unique. Something that said that Resident Evil is back and it's much worse than ever. That something was the Baker family. And oh man, are these guys one hell of a freak show. The Bakers and their various pet freaks are the primary antagonists of the game and fill out the stalker role made popular by creatures like Mr. X in RE2 and Nemesis in RE3. Where they differ from these two is that they are much closer to being truly free agents, moving around their respective domains and being a persistent threat to Ethan all the way through. Or at least until some significant boss fight which sees them ultimately finished off. Just fucking stay dead, okay? The biggest difference though is that the Bakers have faces that look human and can speak with voices just like ours. They aren't completely mindless or instinctual creatures like zombies or silent stalkers like Mr. X. No, these guys have motivations and feelings. They get angry and jealous and they really enjoy hunting you and want you to know about it. 
I can honestly say that my first time playing Cat and Mouse with Jack Baker is still one of the most terrifying and frustrating gameplay moments I've ever experienced, and I rage quit and uninstalled the game at least once, so it's a testament to just how hooked I was on this game that I wound up coming back to it to put up with all this bullshit. The main house is also infested with moulded. These are creatures formed from this black tar-like mould that is caked all over the walls of this house. They are the bread and butter enemies of the game, a combination of things made from other people that have had the misfortune of winding up here, and something else entirely. These are easily the weak point in the game's lineup. I'm glad there are zombies, I mean, we may as well call them that since that's the role they fulfill, but these things aren't as interesting as actual zombies, and aren't even all that scary. They're a little comical if I'm being honest, and I think the developers know this too, as it comes across quite a lot in the end of Zoe DLC. These are where you'll need your headshot skills refined to a point, at least in the early game. In old school RE, slow moving zombies and the relatively wide spaces meant that avoiding combat was a serious and mostly preferable option in those games. That's not really possible here. The molded move much faster than zombies and lol and sway around a lot more, making it quite difficult to get a lethal shot set up with the handgun, but also making them really hard to simply run away from especially because they're really not shy about following you all the way up to the safe room door if it comes to it. There is some enemy variety here, with stronger variants showing up to cause more trouble in the late game, but they all kind of look the same, which makes them easy to get accustomed to. Likewise, I'd argue that the stronger variants, these big boys for example, are actually kind of cheap all things considered, but it's not rage quittingly bad, especially with how generous the autosaves are. One thing that's nice about coming back to RE7 with more experience is the overall need to craft fewer health drinks, leaving a lot of space left over to craft better pistol ammunition. This can turn you into quite the powerhouse late game, as can taking advantage of their single-minded stupidity in some of the tripwire mazes. I've got a larger video on RE7 from back in the alpha days of this channel, so I don't want to spend too much time going over the same ground. I'll leave a link in the description for you, but I have had something of a change of heart about one person in particular, aka this asshole. So, I don't like Saw. Actually, let me use the words from my previous video here. And this utter abomination in storytelling managed to get seven sequels, even surviving the original villain's death. Good lord, what is wrong with people? I mean, it's not like anyone ever wrote a good story about a man dying from cancer, let down by the American healthcare system, and finally breaking free of social conformity to reveal himself to be a true monster inside. No, that's never been done well at all, has it? So yeah, given I could see serious sore inspirations on this guy, I had a bad impression of him and his little games from the get-go, and his testing area on your first run especially is unbelievably frustrating. It has a sense of being slapped together rather quickly, and has a single gimmick of being full of tripwires and enemies that occasionally spawn in behind you without warning. That's an unbelievably cheap move, and a massive game design no-no. Coming to it on a replay though, isn't quite so bad. First, you aren't going to be caught out by all those cheap tripwires, and second, you may get the idea to leave a few around for the enemies to wander into. But now we have to talk about the man himself. You see, I've been working for a while on a script for a video about what makes a great villain, and the thing is, the criteria that I set there, well, Lucas fits them all, maybe even more so than Jack Baker. This is evident by the fact that I absolutely hate Lucas. I can't stand his face or his voice, and every word that comes out of his mouth makes me want to punch his jaw clean off, and I derive immense satisfaction from playing the Not A Hero DLC and just blowing holes in this guy's head as Chris, until this happens. Game over. <laughs> this is actually how to write a really hateful villain. It's not the big things that get under a reader or player's skin, it's the little slights. Insults aimed at the protagonist, taunts and other bullying techniques, things we can all relate to having experienced at some point. These are what make you hate a villain. And unless you're trying to make a sympathetic villain, getting your audience to hate them is the name of the game. It occurred to me that I was letting my distaste for Saw actually colour my view of something that only looked kinda like it on paper. The testing area climaxes in what you might call the birthday cake room. 
It's an overly elaborate and disgusting little game designed to basically make the player burn themselves alive, while Lucas watches on a camera and probably jerks off before uploading the feed to the dark web or whatever he does with it. The way to resolve this puzzle is by finding a video of the previous victim's experience in there, and learning the code for the door before Ethan even gets locked in there. Effectively, Lucas's own hubris is his undoing. The room is a classic example of an incredibly dumb saw puzzle. I mean, just cover the candle with your hand for Christ's sake. But when we get in there as Ethan, we actually get to play out the power fantasy of not dancing to his tune. We get to escape the trap that leads to Lucas fleeing in fear for his life at what's coming for him. It's actually an incredibly powerful moment for Ethan, transforming him from the scared prey into an object of fear for one of the Baker family. The climax of this section is actually one of my favourite moments in the game when Jack 2.0 appears for his last big fight. This also sort of marks the end of the horror section of the game, with things starting to feel much more action oriented from this point on until the end of the game. So to wrap up this part of the video, I guess we need to talk about Evelyn. As with most RE games, a great deal of unmasking is done in the third act, and what could have at one point been any variety of supernatural horror is all transformed into a kind of twisted science fiction which, as we'll talk about later, is just a little disappointing when it comes to this game. In the case of RE7, that's where we're introduced to Evelyn. There's a lot of hints of some greater power in the house, even from the very outset of the game when we see things like this. And hear the mutterings of both Jack and Marguerite, and find various scribblings and writings that pertain to something wanting a family. Between the second and third acts of the game, we are actually tasked with exploring a kind of nursery in the old house, and we have a couple of close encounters there as well. Stay away. These aren't just little jump scares though, as we'll soon discover. They hint at something much, much worse going on. The horror in the Baker household actually started over three years ago, and is something we can get some idea of during the late game flashback sequence and by playing the DLC, Daughters. Mia Winters was working on some kind of classified project for a shady syndicate known only as The Connections, and judging by her conversations with her partner here and the way she reacts to a great deal of what she sees going on, she wasn't exactly ignorant of the nature of the project. Evelyn is a bioweapon, a human altered in the womb by something called the Megamycete Mold. This is a strange sentient mold with mutagenic properties, the origins of which are… well we'll get to that. Since the experiments were basically creating a powerful superweapon out of a little girl, they brought in Mia to act as mother, effectively imprinting her onto Evelyn so that family bond and authority could be used to control her. The project went about as well as you could expect, and ended with a shipwreck during a hurricane and a good man finding a helpless little girl alone and cold in the swamp and bringing her home to take care of her. Oh, Lucas, you just hush. Long outgrown that room. Always want to run a bed and breakfast. <laughs> Got your big break, didn't you? <laughs> Get her to bed. I'll put some soup on. And that there is the last loving words that Jack Baker will ever say to his wife before the entire family and Zoe's life goes to hell. They're mine now. What? <laughs> Evelyn has the power to infect people around her with spores from the fungus she was genetically spliced with, causing mutations within their hosts, but also bringing them under her control, or rather leaving them open to her very powerful suggestion. The consciousness of the host becomes trapped within an odd collective mental space that we'll learn more about later, and it's here we're actually able to communicate with Jack Baker and get the full measure of the man we took a chainsaw to. Free my family. Please. That line right there always breaks me. From here, it's full sprint guns blazing to the final encounter with Evelyn and the revelation of what had been staring us in the face all along. No! No, no, no! <laughs> you. And with the final shot spent, the only thing left is for the cavalry to turn up and clean up the mess, with a friendly and familiar face there to let everyone know that the nightmare is over 
and everything is safe. In the aftermath of the Baker House event, Chris Redfield embarks on his own crusade to thwart Lucas Baker in the all-action DLC, Not a Hero. Something that strongly foreshadows where things would be going in the next game, and the last remaining sane member of the Baker family, Zoe, is saved by the unlikeliest of heroes, the reclusive and solitary Joe Baker in The End of Zoe. These are both great experiences, and I urge you to look at my video on them and give them a try for yourself if you haven't already. I really enjoy how Capcom can take the formula of the base Resident Evil game and twist it up just enough to feel like a completely different experience. Our heroes all get their happy ever afters, as Ethan can once again restart his life with Mia, and Zoe is finally free from the Nightmare House and the family that tormented her. It's actually not the way these things usually play out in horror, but it's the right end to this story. In the end, what worth is a trip through the darkest places if there isn't some hint of light at the end of the tunnel? What lessons can be learned if all we are met with is despair and loss? And if you're planning on getting at least one more multi-million dollar game out of an idea, what good really is a dead protagonist to any of us? Hold on to that thought. It's going to come up again before the end of this particular discussion. One of my major gripes was that by the end of RE7, and much more so by the end of 8, and I suppose this is where the hot takes start, so be warned, I almost feel like this story being part of the official RE canon actually holds it back more than anything else. When the events in the Baker family estate were an isolated incident involving just a few people, I had no problem going along for the ride, but as soon as Chris Redfield shows up and I'm forced to acknowledge that the events of RE5 and 6 and the whole city that got wiped out in Revelations plus all the chaos of the animated movies all happened in this world, suddenly this doesn't seem like such a special little story after all. All of the potential supernatural horror or even cosmic horror falls away and reveals it's just another regular Tuesday for Chris and his buddies who've been using conventional weapons to put down these bio super weapons for about the last 20 years, leaving one to continue wondering, what is the point of trying to make this happen? Gretchen, stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. Now, one interesting take could be that, if we consider Chris to be the star, or at least one of the stars of Resident Evil, then Ethan is just an NPC side character in one of his stories, and Chris just happened to be a day late this time to prevent him from going through a night of unmitigated hell. So while I'm not saying it's bad that Chris showed up and we got to see a familiar face at the end of Seven, I was just a little bummed that we'd gone from some potential series reboot with limitless possibilities, right back around to where we were, at least for the story, by the end of Six. This sentiment is going to come up a lot from now on, not because I dislike these games, I flat out love RE7 and RE8. I just think if it had been its own unique IP, we could have been in for an even wilder ride than the one we got. So fresh off of giving us both a sequel and a spiritual successor to the Raccoon City saga, Capcom got straight back to work. Far from being done with Ethan Winters or with shameless callbacks to their previous outings, pre-production on Village actually started prior to the release of RE7 meaning no one even knew if Seven would be a hit before they started working on what came next. I'm not sure where this particular mandate came from, but it's clear that the goal with Eight was to do for RE4 what Seven did for the Raccoon City saga. This meant that once again, slow-paced horror would have to give way to a unique kind of action, while resource management and disempowerment would fall at the wayside in favour of more crafting options and numerous weapon upgrades to really overpower your character late game. Likewise, disgusting, perverted horror would give way to something more campy and schlocky. The villains of this piece would be larger than life, in some cases quite literally so, comic book monsters with charismatic personalities and a flair for the dramatic, and the stalker system that had done so well in RE7 and the remake of 2 would return, but with its own twist in different areas. And of course, we couldn't have a successor to RE4 without a charismatic gun merchant to keep us well armed all the way through. It's a hell of a jump from 7 to 8 in terms of tone, but the game is really fun, which is exactly why I'm here talking about it today. So to begin, I really like the intro to RE8. I completely understand if you feel it's a little off-brand, though to be honest I'm not really sure what's on-brand for this IP anymore, but I am an absolute sucker for this kind of art and animation style. 
I don't want to get too carried away going on about the Village of Shadow animation though, and the game actually has a short documentary about the making of it packed with it, so I recommend you go check that out. I probably could do an entire video just on this though, as it's really captivating to me, and I'm somewhat acquainted with what it takes to make an animation like this. What's most interesting about this weaponized nightmare fuel is that it's being narrated by Mia Winters as she reads it to her and Ethan's relatively newborn daughter, Rosemary Winters, and that she claims this is actually a local folk tale. This is the story's first big ask of its players. You see, in the aftermath of the Baker family incident, Chris had Mia and Ethan placed into a witness relocation program. This was to protect them from both the shadowy connections who manufactured Evelyn, and were gathering data via Lucas Baker all through her time at the house, and the actual source of the Megamycete mold that was responsible for all this which has yet to be uncovered. This is incredibly unfortunate because the four monsters in this cautionary tale are clearly the four lords of the village, implying that this story is probably based off actual sightings of this village and its resident evils. I mean, what are the chances, right? I rather enjoy this opening in the house though. It reminds me somewhat of Resident Evil 3 Remake. How we can just walk around Jill's apartment at our own pace for a few minutes before all hell breaks loose. And once again, all hell does break loose. Though not in the way you'd expect exactly. This time it's Chris that shows up to turn Ethan's life on its head, first putting several bullets into Mia's head, and then making off with Rose without giving Ethan so much as a hello or an explanation of what the hell is going on. He might regret that later. I know it's too late now, but we really should have told Ethan the plan. There wasn't time. And we didn't expect Miranda to act so soon. Even so, you should have told him. This move got his alignment called into question by more than a few fans prior to the game's release, and after that, things move pretty fast. Poor Ethan Winters. The man loses his wife, finds her again three years later locked in some kind of murder basement, has his hand chainsawed off by her, lives through a traumatic night of horror, gets disappeared to Eastern Europe, only to have his so-called protector gun down his wife in front of him, make off with his baby daughter, and now he seems to have been involved in a car crash that was more than a little fatal to the other guy. He sure can live through a lot, huh? This next part I feel is somewhat symbolic as we are once again funneled through what feels like an ever-tightening space. With an oppressive darkness closing in all around us, the sound of crows and the sights of fresh kills in our path. But, rather than descending into disgusting water once again, we emerge into... Now that's a view. As with RE7, we're in something of a curated section of the game. Sure, we're able to control Ethan, but we're really just moving him between set pieces, and it's not really until we escape our initial captivity in Castle Dimitrescu that we can begin exploring the environments freely. But these set pieces do go about introducing our wonderful cast of villains, and really setting the tone for how this game is going to play out. Let's take a little time to appreciate each stage of this introduction, before we dive into the real meat of the game and its mechanics meeting our colourful villains, and finally moving on to the ultimate fate of the hero, whom this whole video is something of a love letter to. Resident Evil 7 and 8 are wildly contrasting games. Where RE7 takes place at night, 8 takes place in the light of day. Where Swampland inspires thoughts of oppressive heat and humidity, this is a world covered in snow and biting frost. Where 7's villains were disgusting and terrifying, Eighths are larger than life and campy, and where Seven's house was ancient and claustrophobic, Eight's environments are vast spectacles. The titular village is the focal point of the game, and our first stumbling exploration through it does just as much to set the tone for the entire game as the trip through the Baker guest house does for the previous one. All the way through our approach to this place, we can hear the snarls of some large hound and see the handiwork of things possessed of carnivorous teeth and claws, and since we've probably seen a trailer or two in the run-up to this game, we certainly know what's coming. After all, this is Romania, and Eastern Europe is the birthplace of creatures like the Strigoi and modern romantic vampires. I mean, yes, werewolves are more of a Germanic thing, but I'm not going to start crying cultural appropriation over this. This opening is very well done though. Just like in Seven, it takes its time. Even though we are entering into something less horror and more action, 
we once again start slow. The atmosphere is built cautiously with a combination of sound and silence. The houses we explore seem well lived in, as though they were only recently abandoned. The blood we see is fresh, and the vehicles seem functional and cared for. Mostly. Almost as though a couple of hours ago, everyone just vanished. Our first meeting with another human here highlights the improvements to RE8's facial textures and animations as we meet this truly desperately terrified old man, and a matter of moments later, all hell literally breaks loose. This first section frustrated me quite a lot on my first playthrough, even on normal. It really sucks to be charging around an environment I know nothing about, searching for some kind of escape, while what seems to be an infinitely respawning number of enemies is chasing me down. I don't know if I'm supposed to stand and fight, just run to a certain location, or just hold out till something happens, which I'd consider to be the worst of the options because it basically robs you of agency. That being said, this kind of is the tone for the game, at least until you get well equipped. Ethan is faster and better trained in firearms than he was in 7, but there is a general sense of being more on the back foot than a power fantasy character. It creates a more frantic combat loop which is constantly mixed up with enemy variety. This is also a very obvious callback to the Village Square set piece in RE4, right down to the mega boss enemy showing up for a piece of the action and the chiming of the church bells inciting the enemies to flee a matter of moments before they can finish Ethan off. So, after our crash course in the combat mechanics, we collect any lay and scrap that's been dropped on the ground and got some kind of clear idea of who runs the show around here. For now though, we'll be leaving the village. We'll be back though. The village is one of my favourite kinds of hub worlds, that's unlocked over multiple visits and teeming with secrets to find throughout. In many ways, it's exactly the same as a survival horror location, but it's a larger outdoor area than say a mansion or a police station full of zombies. There are several points of access that become available to us throughout the game, and on each visit the enemy layout has changed and in some cases significantly upgraded. What I love though is that every house we can enter tells a story. Everything feels handcrafted and put together with care and attention to detail. They give us a really vivid image of what life was like here. There's little to no modern technology anywhere. Everything is analog and simple. This place feels like it's trapped in pre or post World War I. Looking around we can see photos that seem to be of a religious nature, and it always feels like there's just one more little secret to find somewhere. The village makes you appreciate the map in this game, that is colour coded to let you know when you found all the items hidden in a particular area. We get acquainted with the layout over several visits, which is kind of subtle training for a later combat section where we take control of Chris as he and his hounds move in at night to dish out some real damage, and having the layout already well programmed into us helps with creating the smooth forward momentum that this section is going for. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. That's probably going to happen a lot though actually. We still aren't out of the curated section of the game yet, but this video isn't exactly a play by play of the story either. What's important here is the discovery that this isolated village has some interesting occult beliefs, somewhat familiar to many a Lovecraft story, or maybe a certain M. Night Shyamalan movie that shares the title with this game. We're not dealing with a simple out of the way community here that still gets TV and something resembling internet, but rather a full on regressive culture that seems to have voluntarily cut itself off from the rest of the world and actively shuns outsiders as if they were horrific plague bearers which is some next level social distancing when you stop to consider the things viruses can do in the RE-verse. We catch early on the first hint of the perverse religion that runs through this place during our brief encounter with the locals which is… As the midnight moon rises on black wings, so we make our sacrifice. Well it's a little weird I guess. It's a good thing Ethan's been through worse than this. Like, way worse or he might be feeling a little unnerved by all this strange behaviour. 
Most importantly though is the discovery that lichens and other horrors are simply a fact of life to these people, but their devotion to their living goddess Mother Miranda has kept the monsters from their door. At least it did until very recently, right around the time Chris turned up and blew holes into Mia Winter's head to be specific. One escape from a burning building later leaves us on the road to a very large castle that dominates this absolutely spectacular landscape, the likes of which does not actually exist anywhere in Romania, and if it did, would be a national heritage site and pull in about as many tourists a year as Kyoto. But I'm not here to fact check a game about werewolves, so let's meet our villains. Ethan's initial attempt at entering the castle is interrupted by Mr. Carl Heisenberg, or what I can best describe as Hobo Magneto, or Magneto at home. Well, that's what I'd be calling him if he wasn't easily the most layered and charismatic of the four lords that we are about to meet. Rather than simply overpower and destroy a potential massive spanner in the works while he's off guard, Heisenberg wraps Ari's favourite punching bag up in a tightly fitting metal suit and drags him off to get an eyeful of the shit he's landed himself in this time. And here they are, ladies and gentlemen, the four lords of the village. A mother and her four bickering children, all fighting over how best to, extravagantly, end poor Ethan Winter's life for the crime of... Well, being in the wrong place at the wrong time is a guaranteed trip down into the depths of hell in any RE game, so I guess it's as good a reason as any? The proceedings are presided over by the game's final boss and mastermind of this whole sordid affair, Mother Miranda. She has that odd position in writing where she's basically being saved for the end, which leaves her the least amount of time to be well characterised beyond what other people say about her. This kind of thing can work with extremely powerful Dark Lords like Sauron for example, who are much more a force of nature than a person, but since Miranda walks among us and we are absolutely going to be taking a shotgun to her at some point, she needs a little more going on for her than that I think. Without dropping any major spoilers at this stage, I will say she does a hell of a job of establishing her superiority over Ethan when she does finally show up. But a relationship with a grand enemy needs time to develop. There needs to be slights and insults, the kind of pain we can relate to, not just the big grandiose stuff. Jack Baker had a lot of time to establish himself as a disgusting and hateful enemy whose very voice sent icy fingers of fear rushing through us before we finally got to take first a chainsaw to him and later his own magnum and shotgun, and both of these encounters, despite being mechanically quite simple, are incredibly satisfying experiences for just how much we really want to hurt this guy. Shame we were all so wrong about him, huh? But on the undercard, things are much more interesting. We have Lady Dimitrescu, who, let's face it, even if you don't know anything else about this game, you know who the big steppy vampire mommy is. Then there's this ruined thing called Moreau. The silent puppet mistress Donna Beneviento and the charismatic metal molder Heisenberg. Much like with RE7, each lord occupies their own domain. That is its own self-contained environment. Each lord will stalk you and torment Ethan through their domain, and each will do it in a somewhat unique way. The similarities end there though, as where RE7 was as close to a true AAA survival horror game as we've seen in forever, 8 is more of an action focused game with some of the environmental puzzle elements of a survival horror game. Also, while there was something of a consistent tone through most of RE7, this game feels like it's different seasons of a show all written by different showrunners, none of whom were talking to each other in the process, and there are strengths and weaknesses to this I'd say. The most important thing though is, it all somehow just falls together into a spectacular mess that is fun from start to finish and keeps you coming back to see what absurd shit is going to happen next. Kind of like this one schlocky movie I saw once with another hero who had his hand chainsawed off. Who the hell are you? Name's Ash. Housewares. So let's take it in the order that we get it in the game and talk through it. Who knows, maybe by writing it all out it'll all start to make sense to me. Each lord takes their inspiration from some aspect of classic horror literature or folklore. The most obvious of these is Lady Dimitrescu, who is very much inspired by Dracula, and Heisenberg being an interesting take on Frankenstein, seemingly being both the creator and the monster at once. Moreau is an interpretation of various sea monsters or merpeople myths, albeit one lacking the alluring charm that these creatures are famed for. 
Donna Beneviento is not exactly based on one particular story, but more so the range of ghost stories and urban legends centered around the idea of possessed objects, and very specifically, dolls in this case. I guess we could say she's a take on a certain old Italian carpenter and his desire to make a real boy, but the Fables comic series already did the best possible subversion of that character. Lady D was the face of Village's marketing. I'm not entirely sure if Capcom predicted the reaction the general public would have to her, or if they just rolled with it once it happened. Either way, with the castle being the most prominent landmark on the landscape, Ethan makes a beeline for it believing that's where his daughter is being held, and very quickly finds himself, once again, at the agonizing mercy of the mistress of the house and her delightful daughters. Escaping this particular hand torture does however mark the end of what I'd call the curated section of the game. From here we are finally imbued with true player agency, and it's now time to play some Resident Evil. So yes, I'm here to talk about the story, gunplay and level design, but first, I'm here to talk about the Duke. Because, good god, do I love this guy. Of all the charismatic freaks this game has to offer us, of all the mysteries it sets down for us, of all the questions we yearn for answers to, none is greater than this. Speaking of foolish questions, who or what are you? <laughs> Even I can't quite answer that. The Duke is the successor and kindred spirit of RE4's Gun Merchant, another character who presented far more questions than answers in his respective game. Gun Merchant, or Gun Guy as he is known among my circle of friends, was a gameplay mechanic first and a part of the story second. RE has always to one degree or another known it's a game. That is to say, concessions to reality are made in the name of making a game that is fun to play first. So for example, stalkers not entering safe rooms, enemies dropping coins for no reason, and just the absolute absurdity of this whole setting, especially in the late game. We'll deconstruct this part later. So having weapons and upgrades sold by an actual character with a personality of sorts, who just pops up everywhere without any explanation, and seems to be completely unfazed by the legions of mutants attacking everything in sight was perfectly fine. And the overall lack of information about him has led to numerous fan theories that really stretch the concept of deductive reasoning to its limits. It was a lot more fun than having some between mission gun store menu and created one of the most beloved and talked about characters in the entire RE canon. The Duke is more than a mechanic though, he actively involves himself in the narrative, giving Ethan vital information on his journey, and is even referenced in several documents written by other characters. Meanwhile, not even Ashley acknowledges Gun Guy's existence through all of RE4, so who's to say Leon isn't just finding all that stuff on the ground, and that Gun Guy isn't just some parasite-induced hallucination? The Duke has a kind of sage or deus ex machina role in the game. He knows who Ethan is and the purpose of his mission even before Ethan has any idea of where he is or what he's doing here. He has everything Ethan needs to get the job done, from information to weapons and supplies to upgrades and even just a friendly shoulder to lean on in a dark moment. What we know about him from development is that he was conceived as one of the lords of the village along with the other freaks we just met. There's evidence of this both in the coat of arms found in his wagon, implying he once held some great station, and the existence of the nightmare known as Evil Duke that antagonizes Ethan's daughter in the Shadow of Rose DLC. You know, every time I write DLC I always type expansion pack first and then have to delete it. That original character arc seems to have been dropped entirely, and the Duke is now part of a collection of deus ex machina characters that exist to supply heroes with the firepower they need to destroy powerful monsters in the RE universe. This in and of itself is a wonderful concept for its own story, just not one that really fits into the same world as so many other RE games. Mechanically, the Duke is the shop. He has a main station outside the village, but also, despite his considerable mass, miraculously appears with inside each Lord's realm to offer his services, such as weapon sales, upgrades and support items, as well as crafting recipes so that Ethan can make a wider variety of destructive tools on the fly. On that note, I'd just like to add that it's a big help that the game actually pauses when you dip into your inventory this time. I totally get what they were going for with 7, especially because historically reloading your guns through the menu was a hack to skipping animations in a tight spot, 
but I honestly think that particular feature should have been saved for the Madhouse mode and not the standard experience. Still, it's pretty cool that Ethan can pause mid-fight with a giant monster, craft up a bunch of extra bullets and explosives, and then use them to finish the damn thing off. One unique feature of the Duke's shopping experience is the option to craft recipes that will grant permanent stat boosts. The Duke is clearly a lover of the finer things and the material, and he's not about to pass up a chance at some authentic Romanian grub, and I wouldn't either if I were him. So you can take a break from desperately searching for your daughter to hunt down some wild animals to fill up these recipe requirements, and take a minute to sample the Duke's culinary skills. Man can't save the world on an empty stomach after all. His laugh is jovial, his words positive, and he's a genuinely pleasant sight in a world full of things that want nothing more than to tear giant chunks of skin out of you. The Duke could be the subject of his own video, along with this guy, and maybe one day I'll do just that. But I digress. Where were we? So while the castle does hold out on turning Miss Step On Me loose on you, her daughters will make themselves into a problem early on and assist in funneling you into some of the essential early game areas. The castle is actually a lot like a regular survival horror location. This is to say it's explored in laps, with a focal point being the area's safe room, which is used to offer a moment of respite from the tension and let you resupply yourself from the Duke's Emporium before you run out onto the next leg of your journey. It's also here that you'll have chance to indulge in this odd little physics-based minigame. I'm not exactly sure why they decided to include this, but it's certainly a fun little distraction, and to be honest, given everything else you go through playing any RE game, I'd say that's not such a bad thing. The castle actually feels very functional and believable too, much more so than Salazar's sprawling fairground monstrosity. I've walked around many an old estate in the UK, and it is quite clear that a lot of research was done on the architecture and general layout of places just like this. I like how verticality is also a factor in traversal, with each level of the castle offering something a little different. From the dungeons infested with what remains of the serving girls that used to clean up around here at the bottom, to the rooftop and its spectacular views and rifle-based sniper combat, there's quite a variety of aesthetics and pacing in each area. And as the castle opens up, it's possible to set up fast escape routes from the area's primary antagonist. While the level and environment design does feel very survival horror, Village is clearly an action game that leans hard into its combat loop and man-on-monster action. Ethan is much faster and more mobile than he was in his previous incarnation. This is no doubt down to the military training he underwent as part of the Witness Relocation Program to help him be prepared for the worst. He clearly isn't as competent as Leon in Resident Evil 4 and doesn't have access to head-exploding roundhouse kicks or suplexes, but he's a lot more capable than he was before. Now, on paper, this might look like a first, or in most of my case, a third-person shooter, but I'd call that something of a misunderstanding of how genres work for games. After all, it's not like this game is trying to be anything like Doom or Fear or basically any other FPS with horror themes that you can think of. The player experience is quite different, and it's clear that the choices made here in control scheme, inventory management, enemy movement and the like are all very deliberate and meant to craft a very specific style of play. If you look at RE7 as another example, yes, it's in first person, and yes, you use a gun, but it has way more in common with an old-school survival horror game than it does with an FPS, so I classify it based on its player experience rather than its camera position. So we're looking at something that is, basically, a variation on the RE4 action horror formula, but with puzzle and level design elements taken from survival horror. Ethan's inventory is also very different from 7, which was very limited. He now keeps all his stuff in a case which is reminiscent of Leon's Hitachi briefcase from 4, and I got just as much satisfaction keeping this one organized and neat as I did that one. <sighs> this is the real game right here, guys. But not only is the inventory space overall much larger than before, crafting items and puzzle items are now housed in their own compartments, basically meaning you rarely, if ever, need to unload anything from your inventory to make space for something else. Which is good really, because the storage boxes are no longer a thing. So with all that in mind, you can rest assured, you won't need to worry about ammunition as enemies will always drop the things you need to craft more. This in turn encourages a more forward momentum style of game, as you should, in general, 
come out of each encounter with either the same amount or maybe even slightly more resources than you had before. So this all comes together into a very satisfying mix of heavy combat mixed with light crafting and resource management as you slowly unlock this old castle, uncovering its secrets, dealing with the three daughters, before finally attracting the ire of the lady of the house herself. Damn, that's gotta hurt. Ethan certainly isn't a stranger to taking down mutated freaks, but the game does everything it can to remind you who's boss, and Lady D is a great example of that. As far as Ari Stalkers go, she's a good balance, covering enough of the castle to keep you looking over your shoulder for her, and running like hell when you do see her. But she never gets really tiresome like Mr. X does in the remake of 2. This whole section climaxes with one hell of a boss fight too. Her Majesty here finally sheds any semblance of humanity she had left to reveal the true nature of the beast within. Her shape was inspired by dragons, as Dracula's name means just that in the novel. While you kinda can cheese a lot of this section by hiding in these little towers here, I'd call this a solid boss fight overall. You're going to need to bring all of your weapons and the skills you've been working on up to this point to bear on her. Taking care of position and distance and selecting the optimal weapon to do the most damage at the right range in the time you have before things go bad. You are both encouraged to play skillfully to maximize your damage, while still getting moments to just cut loose on the woman who's been tormenting you for the last few hours of the game. So, when it's all over, it feels very satisfying and you walk away feeling like you've achieved something. If I had one complaint at this stage though, it's that this feels more like an action thriller than a horror experience. That's not a bad thing exactly, especially because that's what RE4 was as well, and this is clearly a spiritual successor to that. But, you know, Resident Evil is supposed to be scary. So I guess we need to move on to the next Lord and talk about Donna Beneviento, because this was one hell of a surprise for me. I'm going to throw up a mild spoiler warning here actually and say that if, like I had, you've managed to avoid learning too much about this game prior to playing it, then do yourself a favour and skip this part. Trust me, it's worth going in blind. All I'll say is it's just as good as your first time dealing with Jack Baker. This section goes hard in the opposite direction to Castle Dimitrescu. Being a much smaller environment, you get the initial impression that you might not be in for too difficult of a time. That is until you get downstairs and this happens. Please, won't you stay with me forever? <laughs> what? Wait, where's my gun? Okay, yeah, immensely cheap move. Not something I'd usually let slide. You don't train someone to play a game a specific way and then several hours later just tell them they can't do that anymore. Not without creating confusion and resentment from your players. This isn't the only time it's happened and I don't appreciate it elsewhere. I give this one a pass though because the payoff is just so damn good. So this part is a lot like Lucas's testing area. Well the interesting part of that area anyway. Not the annoying as hell tripwire maze that should never have gotten past playtesting without someone pointing out, it absolutely sucks. What we are doing here is basically solving a riddle that, little do we know, will result in us meeting one hell of a messy end. I think playing through this part is what made me reassess my initial opinions on Lucas Baker's testing area, and try to see it without the prejudices I hold against the awful film series that it's partly inspired by. We, the player, of course, know that every step we take on this twisted journey is a bad idea, and that it's going to get much worse before it gets better. We didn't get a VHS tape of how the Mastermind intends it to go down this time to help us escape ahead of time. So the atmosphere builds right up to the point where you find the key to the fuse box that should restart the elevator out of here and… then it all goes dark. It was about this moment that I alt f forward out of the game and decided I needed to take a walk, and while I was doing that, just generally reassess my life, priorities, and ask myself if I really wanted to take this any further. Good God, 
even on a second playthrough, being hunted by this thing is utterly terrifying. I'm not sure if it's the baby laughs or Ethan's very believable terrified yelps and heavy breathing that sells it so hard, but my heart was in my mouth both times I went through this. Maybe it's because this thing has yet to catch me, and I can't just associate death with a game over screen and a reload. I had a very similar experience in RE2 Remake when I was stealthing around as Sherry. I just couldn't bring myself to see a game over screen in that section, and so just reloaded if it looked like I was going to get caught. Finally escaping this walking abortion, no mean feat I might add, brings us back to the ground floor and a face to face with Donna herself. Well, kind of. It's more of a game of hide and seek with her doll Angie. This isn't all that hard if I'm being honest, but failing to locate the doll within a specified time will lead to you getting mobbed by other dolls. It climaxes with easily the worst headache you're ever likely to experience, and we can finally escape this insane asylum and hopefully never return. I need to get out of this place. You said it, pal. Our next target is this rather pathetic wretch here called Moreau, and this is probably, for me at least, the low point of the game. Maybe I just have some built-in prejudice against water levels. The boss fight at the end of this is pretty cool. It's on a similar level to our first encounter with Lady D, but the build-up is where things take a bit of a downturn. Only a small section of this area has you actually wrestling with fodder enemies to collect items. There is a very clear point in the proceedings where we are locked in with our primary antagonist and have his undivided attention, and he in turn, ours. This means running a gauntlet through a flooded area until we can drain it and turn the tables on him. So we are tasked with running across ruined rooftops and unstable platforms to fetch a crank from one windmill and bring it back to another. We can at least skip returning back the way we came. All the while this monster is trying to knock us into the water where we'll be helpless against it, and it can bring down a prompt game over screen for us to enjoy. So we've gone from a kind of slower paced RE4 experience, back to a disempowered horror one, and now we're doing a precision platformer I guess? And let's be clear here, this control scheme is not at all well suited to this kind of traversal. This creates frustration, and I've said before in other reviews, it's a hard balancing act between developing a challenging difficulty curve and just straight up pissing off your players, especially on normal mode. You don't want your players to just breeze through an area, but neither do you want them screaming at their monitors. Failure should feel like something you did to yourself, and something you can learn from for the next time. Not something brought on by controls that don't match the challenge and collision box issues. Now, I applaud Capcom for trying to provide a new experience with each new area you enter. As great as the castle is, it'd get pretty tiring pretty quickly if every area was just a variation on that and far from being scary or exciting, it'd just get kinda repetitive and maybe boring. So great idea to keep things fresh, even if it does mean that the tone is all over the place throughout the game. But in the end, this is a AAA game that was developed by a large team and playtested by a lot of people. And you're honestly telling me that this section was signed off on without anyone saying? Actually, this whole time platform bit is really annoying. Likewise, the whole fall and die thing has always irked me if I'm being honest. If Lady D caught me, I had a pretty good chance of escaping, albeit with a big loss to my health. But that's fair. I had plenty of chances to prevent that from happening, and I still let it happen. The Abomination in House Beneviento apparently does one-shot you if it catches you, but it's never actually caught me, implying I'd have to make some massive error of judgement for that to happen. But this? In games like Precision Platformers, instant death is a given. It's part of the formula. But I didn't buy a precision platformer, I bought a Resident Evil game. I expected to be judged based on my position and aiming, not on how well I timed running between two points. Now, the mission does offset this with very generous checkpoints, that only leaves me asking, what is the point? Even more. I can just brute force my way through it, restarting at a new checkpoint with every mess up. So sure, I get it done, but I don't enjoy it. I don't feel like I overcame a great challenge and earned my reward. So yeah, not a big fan of this section. This is also where the environment starts to get a little stupid. I can sort of get with a forgotten insular community existing without notice, but this massive dam here definitely wasn't built by some locals in their spare time. 
and I doubt whichever government or private company that put this together just decided to abandon their investment and forget all about it. The final battle with Moreau is pretty fun at least. It's something of a game of cat and mouse where the mouse has to turn the tables on the cat. There are various explosives scattered around to lure this big dumb creature into, before you get a chance to really lay into him with some firepower. It's actually very satisfying after the previous section's frustration. I also kinda like that Moreau expresses fear at his coming death, because it adds a layer of realism to his character, as this rejected wretch just trying to win back the affection of a lover who spurned him. He's not the first one either. One of Lady D's daughters also expresses despair at the tables being turned on her. <laughs> I don't wanna die. And I do really like this extra human layer that these new monsters have. It makes them so much more interesting than mindless zombies or silent Terminator-like characters. It is quite normal for the tone of an RE game to shift from one of horror to one of action by the end. Even in the classic entries, reaching the lab means you've uncovered most, if not all of the mystery, gotten used to the various enemies and their attack patterns, and, assuming you didn't screw up, are armed to the teeth and overstocked on health items. You develop more forward momentum, and, sensing the end, probably get more liberal with using those handgun bullets and shotgun shells. Even RE4 goes pretty wild in the final section. The island is something of a mess in terms of pacing. One minute you're in an epic gun battle with heavy enemies wielding miniguns, then you're moving cautiously through narrow corridors as you hear incredibly disturbing breathing, and keep that thermal scope to hand to deal with the worst enemy in the game. And then there's an entire section where you're being backed up by an attack helicopter and basically just moving between hiding places and holding on for dear life while it does all the work. By the time you arrive on the ship in RE7 2, this small horror story is ready to blow up into a machine gun action game, as you are fueled with enough bullets and explosives to easily fight through a small army of molded. And if you include Chris is Not a Hero DLC into the mix with this, and all its Doomslayer-esque action power fantasy, you can see how things just keep on escalating into something so far removed from where it started. So RE8 does exactly the same thing, and it all starts the moment Heisenberg calls you and tells you he wants to talk. From this moment on, at least to the degree that this control scheme allows, it's time to run and gun all the way to the end. I've talked about the player side of combat up to this point, but what about the enemies? Well, they're pretty good overall, but for one small hitch. Firstly, enemy variety and overall design is much better than the molded from RE7. I really like these Morlock looking lichens and the sword wielding creatures found in Lady D's basement. Much like traditional RE enemies, their movement isn't overwhelmingly fast, though the lichens especially can cover the distance between you and them quite quickly when they want to. The more zombie like enemies lull and stagger towards you while the more intelligent lichens move in bursts, creeping forward before darting one way or another, trying to strategically close the space between you as their numbers fill up behind them creating the feeling of an overwhelming horde closing slowly in around you. This is very deliberate, and places emphasis on positioning and knowing your escape routes, as well as having good situational awareness in larger open environments like the village. It feels a lot like Resident Evil 4 in that way, especially when played in third person, though, as I've said before, while Ethan is more of a powerhouse, he's not at the superhuman level that Leon was at then. <laughs> Headshots are going to do the most damage and put these creatures down in the most efficient way. However, RE8's enemies aren't as resistant as RE7's molded, which could be basically blown to pieces and still keep coming after you until you got that headshot. So, shooting them anywhere will get the job done well enough. RE8, however, does have a much larger and more interesting variety of creatures for you to tangle with. Along with the various fodder enemies, there are larger, more heavily armoured types, and even fully transformed giant wolf creatures. Though, these in particular are usually found in the vicinity of very powerful weapons that can put them down quickly enough. There are also numerous miniboss-style enemies, reminiscent of RE4's dreaded chainsaw ganados, scattered around the world for you to find and tangle with. So, all in all, it's a pretty good lineup to keep you on your toes. I do have one major gripe though, and that's the way grabbing is handled in this game. Getting grabbed and mauled is something of an RE standard, all things considered, with particularly potent enemies being able to one-shot you this way in late-game areas. 
This is your major incentive to figure out the correct distance to stand your ground and work on landing those headshots, as even ones that don't kill can stagger an enemy breaking their stride and giving you a little more breathing room. The issue I have here is the point at which you get locked into a grabbing animation. Most games, including RE7 might I add, have trained us that the most efficient use of a block is right around… here. Just before the attack hits. This incentivizes reacting to incoming blows versus simply holding up a guard and brute forcing through incoming attacks. However, in RE8, anything from about… here onwards is a pre-scripted animation and can't be cancelled by a block. So, you need to have those hands up much earlier if you don't want these things tearing pieces out of you. That gripe aside, this section entering into the lichen layer is kind of a moment to just cut loose and get some payback for all the trouble these things caused you in the opening hours of the game, right up to finally getting a one-on-one -on -one with the big alpha himself. I kinda like it when games do stuff like this. It's a pretty solid revenge moment. It's especially cool if you can kill the Giga Chad boss in the first encounter, which apparently you can do here. After that, it's time to head over to the factory for our date with Heisenberg. Far from being blindly obedient to Mother Miranda though, this guy is actually looking for an alliance. This is why I really like these more sentient enemy types in both 7 and 8. They have motivations and personalities. Sure, a couple of those personalities are annoying as hell, but it makes these monsters actual characters. Maybe not sympathetic ones. Well, Maybe Jack, I guess, but interesting ones for sure. Heisenberg sees Miranda for exactly what she is though. Not blinded by adoration or power like the others, he sees only a disappointed mother looking to cast away her children, and she's been using Ethan Winters as her personal cleaner since he got here. This could very well be because Heisenberg is something of a creator himself and has an intimate understanding of the concept of failed experiments. While Heisenberg is loaded with charm, he seems somewhat lacking in empathy for a father's plight. You and me, then. Together, we can go save Rogues, and then we can use her to grind Miranda into paste. My daughter is not a weapon. Fuck you! In both RE7 and 8, there are several significant turning points where Ethan asserts more and more of his will onto a story that otherwise throws him around. This particular moment is one of my favourites and really demonstrates his commitment to saving his daughter. I suppose given what he saw happen to Evelyn, he can't bear the thought of something similar happening to Rose. Heisenberg's factory is on a very similar scale to Lady D's castle, if not a little bigger overall. The flow of the environment includes a lot of survival horror-esque backtracking, as you find locks that need to be returned to once you have found the key. Or, in this case, made the keys from moulds at this smelter. Much like the mines in RE7 and the island in RE4, it feels like a massive departure from where we started. Nothing is familiar. From the architecture to the sound design, and it almost feels like we've slipped into an entirely different game to some degree. Heisenberg's big trump card against Miranda, you see, is creating cyborgs. Using a combination of his metal mastery, the Megamycete mold, and a healthy dose of mad science. His factory is infested with powerful creatures that have very specific weak spots that need to be exposed before they can be destroyed. This makes these creatures some of the most challenging enemies we've come across in this entire game. You're really going to need to bring everything you've learnt up to this point to bear here and hope you've fine-tuned your skills to a razor's edge to bring these guys down. But it's about here that I sigh inside just a little. I appreciate the awesome spectacle on display here for sure. It's pretty wild, but seriously, where are all these people coming from? The town doesn't have this many people, and if dozens or even hundreds of tourists started vanishing in this particular part of Romania, I think someone would be looking into it, especially when you consider that multiple Raccoon City level outbreaks have already happened in the RE-verse at this time. At the very least, I think Chris might have noticed when he chose to move two endangered witnesses into this location to protect them. I could maybe understand if they were all corpses, but audio logs and documents found within the factory imply that, while initial testing used dead bodies, the results weren't that good, and Heisenberg moved on to experimenting on living people. But okay, sure, why not? We can be in comic book supervillain world now. It's actually very fitting for our final showdown with Heisenberg, that sees us piloting some kind of tank complete with a chainsaw arm because at this point, why the hell not? So 
Sure, it's fun. Big, dumb fun, with an emphasis on the word dumb. I mean, remember that this and this are happening in the same game. So we've spent a lot of time not talking about Ethan Winters in a video called The Legend of Ethan Winters, right? Well, this is also a game analysis, and a hero is only as great as the journey he goes on and the villains he fights in the end. So, let's talk about Ethan for a moment. Ethan is a self-insert protagonist. He's a nobody. He's an NPC in a Chris Redfield game. We have no idea who he is before any of this happened to him. We don't know what his job is, where he lives, what he studied, how he met his beautiful wife, or why she was working for a shady bioweapons research company. Well, none of this is really all that important. Much like with Silent Hill and Signalis, these spaces are left blank for us to fill in however we want. This in turn allows us to have something of a personal stamp on the identity of the character we play. Ethan isn't a true silent protagonist, but he isn't overflowing with conversation or snappy one-liners either. A self-insert doesn't need to be silent though, as is the case with many of the protagonists in the Arcane Studios' immersive sims. This is very deliberate. RE games aren't about lengthy exposition-filled cutscenes, and RE7 in particular doesn't even stop the game while you cycle through your inventory. Characters are kept to a minimum to place emphasis on the isolation you found yourself in, but at some point, things need to be explained to the player, and the best way to do that is have the protagonist actually ask what the hell is going on. The intro to RE7 is incredibly brief, and it's almost a shock when the car stops and you're told to start using the character. It reminds me somewhat of my first time playing Bioshock, and waiting for something to imply the pre-rendered cutscene had finished after the plane crash, and it was time to start playing, only to realise that opening wasn't pre-rendered. Ethan begins his exploration of the Baker Estate as a terrified and mostly useless character that honestly had me screaming at my monitor more than once and inspired at least one rage quit and uninstall. No doubt he's heard about these horrific bioweapons by now, but we see and hear about war every day on the news, and it's not like that makes us any more prepared to actually deal with it if it happens. The opening game of Cat and Mouse with Jack really shows just how vulnerable and desperate Ethan is here. He breathes in desperate heavy breaths as he tries to sneak around, lets out little panic yelps when he sees Jack. He can't outrun him, and he can't fight back like, say, Joe Baker can. But there are men. There are gods. And then, there's Joe Baker. Ethan can't even open a trapdoor with any great speed, it seems. And this little exchange here is quite enlightening as to his state of mind. You don't understand. I gotta get out of here. I calm down. You're not listening to me. There are crazy people in this house trying to fucking kill me. <laughs> Everything about him feels desperate and painstaking. It's a small wonder he doesn't just lose his mind, curl up into the fetal position, and die. Even when we have the pistol, nothing really changes. The weapon sounds like a balloon popping rather than a bullet firing, and it seems to affect Jack about as much too. All we learn about Ethan is that the man can absorb one hell of a beating and somehow keep going thanks to whatever is in these medicine bottles. That being said, Ethan clearly has some firearms experience, and he almost definitely has his limits, which he hits right around my favourite point in the game, and maybe my all-time favourite RE boss fight. This is where things really start to turn around for Ethan. You can feel he's more confident. So are we, in fact. We just survived something immensely horrible, even after that really shaky start. It's starting to feel like maybe just maybe, we can get out of this. By the time Jack 2.0 turns up to menace Ethan again, our hero has really come into his own. This is getting old, Jack! Between RE7 and 8, we know that Ethan has undergone military training. What's interesting here is we needed a new disempowered protagonist in order to return to horror for RE7. It just wouldn't make sense for Chris or Jill with everything they've been through to be being punched around by the likes of Jack Baker, and having Leon suplexing the guy while making snappy one-liners wouldn't be all that scary either. But now Ethan has been leveled up. He's been down the rabbit hole at least once, and he's ready for it if it happens again. Think Sarah Connor in Terminator 1 versus Sarah Connor in Terminator 2. So, in a way, moving things into that RE4 action horror space actually makes a lot of sense. Ethan is now faster, his pockets are deeper, and he isn't held back by many of the shortcomings he had in the previous game. 
He even has time for the occasional quip at his enemies, like here when the Four Lords are debating his fate. Hey, don't I get a say in this? <laughs> SILENCE! That being said, he hasn't seen even half as much as Chris, as evident by his reaction to the baby monster which throws us all the way back to the beginning of RE7. He still has vulnerabilities and is outclassed pretty easily by series veterans. I told you to leave it alone, Ethan! You are in the way. Here's Ethan, for example, fighting at full capacity in RE7. Now here's Chris. And again in 8, Ethan. And Chris. The player experience is almost completely different. Sort of like the difference between playing the base RE2 remake and the fourth survivor. Capcom is really good at this. Ethan has a very impressive character arc. His motivations are simple but believable, and easy to apply to ourselves, and we see him grow from someone who's just thrown around by the story, to someone who really asserts himself, even to the point of returning from… well, I guess it's spoiler time. So if you're not interested in spoilers then I'd say the video ends here, and I'll say thank you for your time, though honestly you really shouldn't be watching a 60 plus minute video on a game even this far if you want a blind experience. So, here we go into the final act. So Ethan's been charging around the village, basically collecting pieces of his daughter. Yeah, it's a little wild, but I mean, look at what else we've been dealing with in this series. You see, Mother Miranda is actually a century or so old biological researcher who grew up in this area. Sometime around the First World War, she lost her daughter to the Spanish flu. I guess Dr. Reed was just a little too late here. And while she was basically looking for a cliff to throw herself off, found the Megamycete Mold. Holy crap, what a monstrosity. We can actually stumble into close proximity to this thing before we get here if we explore around enough, but here it is, the source of all of Ethan Winter's problems. Coming into close proximity with this thing mutated Miranda into the immortal crow lady she is now, but also clued her into something else important. The Mold collects the consciousness of those who die close to it. I have no idea how it does that, but again, it's not the wildest thing this series has ever pulled. Remember, we had a mutant T-Rex in 6, so, you know, just go with it. We actually see briefly into this collective mind space in RE7 when Ethan is merged with the Mold and gets a chance to meet the real Jack Baker. So Miranda has been doing various experiments with the Mold in order to A, extract her daughter's memory imprint, or whatever it is, from within the collective mind of the Mold, and B, to create a powerful host for her daughter to enter into. The four lords we've been wrestling with up to this point are the applicants who didn't make the cut. She now believes that she's found said host in the daughter of two people who were at one point in their lives infected by Evelyn. We get a clearer idea of how all this looks in the Shadow of Rose DLC, which is not Capcom's best if I'm being honest. I actually found this to be a bit of a grind. Some of the imagery we see in it is pretty good for sure, and I'll have some thoughts to share on that later, but a lot of it is really annoying and frustrating. I understand that Rose should be slower than Ethan because she's a 16 year old girl, but that doesn't make it fun to deal with her, that's for sure. The collective mind of the Megamycete though is layered and dense as we see. A lot of spaces are horrible of course, but since it's formed from a variety of personalities then there's plenty of spaces without danger to be found. So that's big spoiler number one. Number two however is... Damn, that's gotta hurt. I think we all knew our boy here wasn't dead exactly. I mean, they've been telling us there's something off about him since the dinner scene at the Baker House. I am totally fine with Ethan not reacting too much to his hand being replaced in this scene. He's been overloaded with all kinds of horrific sensory input since he arrived at the Baker guest house, and he probably isn't even sure if that fight with Mia even happened. By the time he's fully conscious and aware, Jack is trying to remove his lower jaw, so it's no wonder he doesn't ask everyone to hold up and explain what happened to him. Admittedly, Ethan didn't do the sensible thing when his hand was chainsawed off and pass out from shock before dying of blood loss, but then we wouldn't have much of a game, would we? 
But this set piece that takes place if Jack corners you in the pantry before you can escape down the trapdoor is very telling that not all is as it seems here. What the fuck? Then there's the fact that Ethan can see the child form of Evelyn. This is an indication that her spores are inside him, at the very least, and working their twisted magic on him. Sure, it's going a lot slower than it did for Jack and Marguerite, but Zoe held out for years without going crazy, so it's clearly not a simple process. On top of that, there is all the horrific punishment this guy keeps bouncing back from. At some point, I think, even he knew something was amiss. So, after a brief all-action set piece with our boy Chris that once again highlights the futility of these feral bioweapons in the face of weapons that we've had for decades, we find Ethan buried somewhere in the Megamyce Collective, and a certain young lady has something important to tell him. You were always dead. What are you saying? Remember. Baker House. You were murdered by Jack. So, yeah, Ethan isn't Ethan. Not the original, anyway. And more importantly, Mia knew. I tried to keep this a secret, but. You don't understand how special he is. This moment here is cheesy, but I kinda like it. It just shows Ethan's single-minded determination. Even in the face of this mind-blowing revelation, all he can think about is his daughter and getting her home. And so, he awakens in the back of the Duke's wagon. The sage has brought him to the spot of his final confrontation. Much like any great hero, Ethan is now so completely changed, he can never return home. Or rather, if he could, it wouldn't be the same person who had started the journey, and he likely wouldn't be sticking around. In a way, of all these insane bioweapon experiments, Ethan is the only one that really succeeded. He's the only one who retains all his faculties, who doesn't succumb to any kind of madness, who doesn't degenerate or mutate into something warped and disgusting. He existed so perfectly as a human for so long, that even he didn't know there was anything different about him, and he could literally have his heart torn out and still obey a simple order to save his daughter. I mean, wasn't that the point from the start? Wasn't this the elevation of humanity that Spencer started Umbrella to achieve? So, I laid out my hot take earlier, but I think a lot of what we see in the final act really highlights the problem with this being an RE game. Suspension of disbelief is a big one. When this was a small, isolated incident for one person, I was able to go along with it, but when Chris and all his high-tech military gear showed up, I felt like something was being violated. It felt too easy, and again, it seemed like just another day of the week for Big Alpha and his hounds. Something is lost once the story becomes one of many in a world full of mutants and monsters. And look at the Mega My Seat mold. It really feels like the guys wanted to write some kind of Lovecraftian space horror, but were almost hamstrung into making it fit into the RE-verse. Don't believe me? Play Shadow of Rose. Look at the things these guys created once the creative leash was dropped. This imagery is so badass, which is why it sucks that it's just a dream space. If this were really happening, it'd be catastrophic and terrifying. As it stands, it's just nice dressing. Just imagine if this was its own story. If the Megami seat was some sleeping old one, or at the very least some kind of psychic space fungus that fell to earth in prehistoric times that its mutations had been responsible for the rise of so many myths and folklore creatures. If nothing else, this kind of creature absorbing people's consciousness makes more sense than mutated fungus doing that. What about Donna? What if she really had some kind of supernatural connection, and was using that to animate her dolls? Think of the implications and the directions the story could go with that. The possibilities for this story and other stories to follow would be limitless if this wasn't Resident Evil. But because it is, everything has to be explained away as mutations and bioweapons. Which is such a damn shame. Okay, I think that's out of my system now. I do think that this story and this game are great. I just think it could have been a lot more than it was. But with all that said, 
let's close out these proceedings the only way we can. Stories must end. This is something that superhero comics have a real problem with, but it's something I think is so incredibly important. It's not that I don't want to see more Batman, or that I don't want younger generations to enjoy his adventures, but the Dark Knight keeping an internal vigil on Gotham sort of cheapens the whole point of him. What good is he if things aren't getting better? Or if at the very least, he can't step aside and let the next generation take over? I believe this too for the adventures of the mainline RE cast. Chris is over 50 in this game now, and while I understand that a healthy lifestyle and experience count for much more than an arbitrary number, he's getting past the point where he can be running around monster-filled battlefields. The other guys probably aren't doing so hot either. I was overjoyed to see the beginning of a new story when Ethan arrived, but I was just as moved to see it end. In the aftermath of the fight with Mother Miranda, Ethan Winters, a man formed from the Megamycete mold, cannot go home. He can't go back to his wife or his daughter. He can't even hold himself together long enough to get back to the helicopter. He has walked through hell and agony, saved his wife, and now his daughter. Fought monsters and terrors that would overpower and destroy any other man. And yes, I know that the popular theory is that this is Ethan, but I really hope it's not. The father's story has ended. It's time for whatever comes next. Thank you, Ethan. Hey everyone, thanks for taking this ride with me through Ethan Winter's games. So we didn't get any content in February, I know. Between writing issues and real life, it got a little difficult to get focused and get time to put all this together. I also wanted to make sure I had a Resident Evil 4 video finished and ready for release in March, in hope that the algorithm will push it a little harder because of all the hype around the remake. That video is finished and set to premiere on March 18th. I'll do my very best to be there, even if I'm hiding under my blankets in bed or looking at it on my phone. As mentioned in the Signalis video, I'm working on a Prey 2017 video, and the script is finished, and it's possible the audio will already be done by the time this goes live. I had such a good time with this game, and it was actually more fun the second time around than the first. And while I'm not going to tell you what the game after that is, I can tell you that I've had my heart completely stolen by what I'm playing now, and even though it came out last year, it could very well be my 2023 Game of the Year. I'm always late to the party, so it's fine. Prey will come out a couple of weeks after Resident Evil 4. This will give me extra time to invest in future projects and maybe even try to cover a JRPG or one of the other longer games I've had my heart set on talking about for a while. But for now, let's blast into orbit and get back into dealing with space horror and my favourite game genre, the Immersive Sim. Hello to all you late stayers to the party. I see you hiding in the shadows not wanting to face the harsh reality outside. Well, sorry friends, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Hopefully you'll be back for the next big party in a couple of weeks though. Thank you all for sticking around and supporting the channel. If this was your first ride through to the end with me then, be sure to leave a sub and a comment and let me know your take on Ethan and his story. Oh. And since most people have left, this is probably the best time to bring up the fact that I have a Twitter and a Facebook page that nobody follows. But rest assured that when people do start following it, I'll be sharing things there too. Well, peace out and be safe. Until next time.